Elder Robert S. Wood was sustained as a member of the Second Quorum of the Seventy on April the 3rd, 1999. He had been a member of the Fifth Quorum of the Seventy since 1997 and had been serving as an Area Authority 70 for the North American Northeast Area. Elder Wood presently is serving at church headquarters, having recently returned from serving as the president of the Brazil North Area. Elder Wood attended Stanford University in California, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Humanities. He then continued his education at Harvard University, earning both a master's degree and a doctorate in political science. He was a professor of government and foreign affairs at the University of Virginia, and at the time of his call to full-time church service, was dean of the Center for Naval Warfare Studies at the United States Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and also director of Naval Operations Strategic Studies Group. He is widely known for his work in the areas of foreign and national security policy, military strategy, international politics, and international law and organization. Also active in civic affairs, Elder Wood has been a member of the Board of Visitors of two universities and a member of several councils of the Boy Scouts of America. He has held leadership positions with the International Institute for Strategic Studies, the Newport Institute, the World Scholar Athlete Games, and the Armed Services YMCA. Elder Wood has served in numerous church callings over the years, including regional representative, stake president, twice as a bishop, as a Sunday school teacher, a priest quorum advisor, and as a full-time missionary in France. Elder Wood and his wife, Dixie Lee, are the parents of four daughters, and they presently have ten grandchildren. Following Elder Wood's devotional message today, the benediction will be offered by Sister Meg Atwood, a senior from Raymond, Alberta, Canada. Elder Wood. I am delighted to be with you today. I grew up in a small little town south of here called Idaho Falls. And when I was in high school, there were three buildings at what was then Rick's College. And it was a two-year program. And it, I have not been back to this campus for many, many years and had the privilege of having a tour of the campus just before uh, lunch. And I must tell you, brothers and sisters, I am truly impressed. This is a remarkable university with a remarkable faculty and remarkable facilities. I don't know if you understand it or not, but BYU-Idaho indeed is in the very forefront of what can only be described as an educational revolution in terms of how we conduct education, how we reach and touch the lives of students, and how we indeed better and strengthen the community. The ancient Greeks, the word for education which they had is padaya. But actually that word which we translate as education actually means the formation of the soul. And I can think of no institution which is making a greater contribution to the formation of the soul than Brigham Young University, Idaho, and particularly under the leadership of your great president who also is a member of the Fifth Quorum, Elder Bedner. He and his wife are the very models of what we are trying to accomplish here at Brigham Young University, and I appreciate them and their hospitality. <clears throat> I want to thank Brother Belknap. That was magnificent. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> that, was, that was beautiful. Uh, you really do have the master's touch and have really set the tone for our meeting this afternoon. Now, <clears throat> when I was 16 years old and was having one of my first dates, there was one girl who I was particularly interested in, and I had arranged a really great series of activities. I had planned out everything, and I figured that it would probably take us till about a little before midnight, and I would have her home by midnight. But when I went to pick her up, her father indicated to me that I would have her home at 10.30. So I also got home shortly after 10.30 and was still very energetic because I had plans in my mind for much more than that. Well, 
Up in my room, I wondered what I was going to do. And I said, well, maybe I can go outside and shoot a few baskets. But I knew that at 10.30 at night, our neighbors would not particularly appreciate that. So I thought of playing some music, loud music, because that was the only kind of music I knew at the time. But I knew that my parents would not appreciate that either, since their bedroom was right below mine. Lying on my stand was a copy of the Book of Mormon, which my mother always put there in the hope that I might read it sometime. Now, I should tell you that I had read in the Book of Mormon, but I had never read the Book of Mormon. But that evening, for no better reason than I had nothing else to do, I sat down and opened the Book of Mormon and began to read. Well, next morning, about 11 o'clock, my parents thought I was sleeping in, it being Saturday, and I didn't have to be at work until that afternoon. But the fact of the matter is, I was not sleeping in. In fact, I was reading the concluding words of Mor Moroni. Yea, come unto Christ, and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength. Then is his grace sufficient for you. Having read that passage, I knelt by my bed and put to the test that promise of Moroni. And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that ye would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. That morning, beyond any demonstration of reason or other evidence, I receive the witness of the Holy Ghost as powerfully as I have ever received in my life, and I knew that the Book of Mormon was of God. And that laid the foundation for all the convictions and indeed most of the activities of my life. Now the following Monday morning, <clears throat> I went to school and encountered a friend of mine, not a member of the church, and he held up a piece of paper. And he waved it in front of my face. And he said, aha. And I said, what do you mean, aha? He said, I have here 50 anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. Now, do you know what an anachronism is? Anachronism is something that just shouldn't be there in terms of time or place. A little bit like saying Julius Caesar drove his Ferrari into Rome. And he said there were 50 of them in the Book of Mormon, therefore indicating that it was not what it purported to be, but was a 19th century text. And I said to him, well, you're too late, because I have received a certain witness that this Book of Mormon is true. But give me your list, I will keep it. And I did keep it, and I have kept it. And over the years, as a result of various ana analysts and analysis by various academics and scholars, one anachronism after the other has fallen off that list. Until several years ago, when I was gi giving a lecture at Cornell University, I mentioned my list and the fact that I had only one item left, but I could wait. But afterwards, a very distinguished professor came up to me and said, well, you can remove your last item, for our studies indicate that it is not an anachronism. Now think for a minute what my life would have been like had I withheld my conviction of the Book of Mormon until I had resolved all the questions that my friend had given me. I've often said that when it comes to the most fundamental truths, I have many questions, but I have no doubts. For there are some things that have been established in my life with such a degree of, uncer of certitude that they transcend whatever immediate questions or incomplete understanding that I have. Some of you might have been able to attend 
the worldwide leadership broadcast last January, where President Boyd K. Packer, <clears throat> at the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, called upon our leaders to measure everything you learn about your ordination and calling against fundamental truths. And then he outlined those truths. Among them are the divine mission of Jesus Christ and His Church, the loss of the precious truths of the gospel, the changing of the ordinances and the loss of the apostolic keys in the apostasy, the restoration under the direction of the Father and the Son and through the prophet Joseph Smith of that which had been lost, and the persistence of the apostolic and priesthood keys in the Church today. President Packer pointed to the Holy Ghost as the sextant that each individual receives at baptism in order to discern and establish in our lives these truths. And then in that same meeting, Elder Neil A. Maxwell similarly addressed our responsibility to receive personal revelation that each of us may have a sure witness of those most fundamental truths. Now I would ask you, what exactly is the nature of the truth of revelation and the witness of the Spirit? We are said to be in the midst of an information revolution. Computers, information storage, analysis, and retrieval systems, networks, artificial intelligence, communication satellites, television and telephonic, telephonic systems. But though we are in an inunda inundated with information, many of us are in fact drowning in ignorance. Indeed, even within the context of this great secular revolution, the information revolution, the great issue is how do you translate the bits and pieces of our knowledge, what we sometimes call the data, how do you translate that into knowledge so that you know what you know and that you are certain that what you've put together actually will endure as true knowledge? Now, scientists and philosophers alike have agreed that we really don't know, that all you have done has really been to establish provisional knowledge, that is to say, knowledge which will last only as long as additional information or new methodologies or new instruments by which we gain knowledge until they come along and then overthrow or change or modify in some way that which we thought to be knowledge, that which we thought to be true. Now I've lived long enough and have taken enough courses in my life from the time I was in grade school through the university to find out that in virtually every one of the sciences the, the basic knowledge has changed. In physics, in biology, you name it, our fundamental understanding have undergone enormous changes over the years. However, sometimes we confuse our provisional knowledge with the thing known itself. There was a remarkable headline in the New York Times some time ago which said, Mass found in a lucive particle. Universe may never be the same again. What the article suggested was that now that scientists know that neutrinos, that's the building block of the universe, that neutrinos have mass that this will slow down the expansion of the universe. Now think about that just for a minute. I suspect that the universe was precisely the same after the scientists had discovered the properties of neutrinos as it was before they discovered those neutrinos. But often we confuse what we think we know with what in fact really is. It's possible, therefore, to know without knowing. In fact, it is written that in the Council of Heaven that Satan, who certainly had lots of information, knew not the mind of God. Wherefore, he sought to destroy the world. Paul spoke of those who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Amos predicted that in our day there would be a famine of knowledge 
And Moroni spoke of a veil of unbelief that causes men to remain in the blindness of their hearts. On the other hand, the Lord has commanded us to serve him with our minds and that we should seek learning by study and by faith. He has counseled us to search after knowledge of countries and of kingdoms, of history and of nature, of things past, of things present, of things to come. He has promised that the veil will be taken from our mind and that it will be enlightened by the Spirit. As a consequence, we shall be both free and holy. We shall know the truth, and the truth shall make us free. But free of what? Free of ignorance, of sin, and of the pangs of death. As the Lord said, if thou shalt ask, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge, that thou mayest know the mysteries and the peaceable things, that which bringeth joy, that which bringeth life eternal. <clears throat> In every field of human intelligence, almost every proposition can be subject to the question, why? Every parent knows this. In fact, I would suggest that probably many of you tormented your parents. You asked them something, and they gave you an answer. And you said, why? And then they gave you another answer, and you said, why? And they give you another answer, and you say, why? And finally, at some point, they say, well, that's just the way it is. <laughs> and you know, that is the ultimate answer. What they were saying is, that's the way the universe is put together. That's just the way it is. And in every field of human knowledge and endeavor, we do get to the point where scientists and philosophers alike will say, well, that's just the way it is. But as I indicated earlier, that is not necessarily just the way it is, because later they find out new things, and they gain more powerful instruments, and they have to admit, well, that isn't the way it is. And so I return to the question, isn't there anything in this life that we can know with absolute certitude without awaiting further experimentation and experience and additional information? And the answer is yes, as President Packer and Elder Maxwell pointed out. There are in this life certain truths so fundamental that they must be established in our lives so that we can actually meet the requirements of life. To meet the tests of mortality, our Heavenly Father has provided a certain witness of those crucial understandings within which we can fit the additional light and knowledge that we may acquire. We may not know all the answers. Indeed, we may not completely comprehend all the questions. But we will have established in our lives a certain framework of understanding that will provide not only an unshakable intellectual and spiritual foundation, but will transform our very lives. And what is this witness? Again, we've said it over and over again. It is the witness of the Holy Ghost. The understanding received from the Holy Ghost has three key aspects. First, it concerns the most critical and transcendent truths. The Holy Ghost will not reveal to you where Kolob is. And if you haven't studied, he won't reveal the answer on an examination. <laughs> that is not his responsibility. He has a very special mission, which is to bear witness to the most fundamental truths of the universe, which we need to know in order to survive and flourish in mortality. That is the great mission of the Holy Ghost. So that is the first critical aspect. 
The second critical aspect of this knowledge, and it's closely related to it, it is definitive. It ends argument. And third, this knowledge changes behavior. The understanding of the Holy Ghost provides, therefore, in the first place, an architecture of knowledge. In effect, it provides, a, if you will, a building with rooms in it. The fundamental rooms, the fundamental building within which we can then put in those rooms additional understanding and information as the years go by. You don't have to be 60 to gain that architecture. You don't have to be 40 to gain that architecture. You can be 16 and gain the fundamental architecture of life itself. Indeed, you can be 14 and gain that understanding. Another way to put it is that the Holy Ghost provides us with an understanding of the first premises of wisdom. You recall that the Proverbists declare that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The prophet Joseph Smith that they said there are three certitudes necessary for us to endure in life. First, to know that God is. Second, to know something of his character, nature, attributes, and perfections. And thirdly, to know that the course that we are living is in accord with his mind and will. As a student in college, I learned that the original premise or proposition of a syllogism or logic train is critical. One may work through a marvelously sophisticated and complex line of reasoning which seems compelling enough at every point in the logic. But if the premise is wrong, it doesn't make any difference how brilliant you are in the construction of the syllogism or the logic. The foundation is fundamentally flawed. For instance, if we begin with the premise that life arose by chance and that its development is largely random, we will interpret physical and biological and social phenomena in a certain way, in a way that in fact will distort and fragment our understanding. And it will have consequences for how we live and how our society lives. If on the other hand, we begin with the premise that mortal life arose by design and will develop according to eternal law, we will understand the bits and pieces of information in a wholly different way. We will see the interconnectedness and the wholeness of life. We will see that ultimately all truth can be contained in one great whole. We will see patterns and purposes. We will, in effect, understand in ways that many who cannot understand. And hence, remember Job, who even in the depths of his misery declared, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? And unto man he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and that apart from evil is understanding. Now the scope of human reason is impressive, itself of eternal and divine origins, and illuminated at birth by the light of Christ. But let us not underestimate the narrowing of perspective arising from pursuing truth apart from God. I'm increasingly struck by the limits and the dangers of what Paul would call carnal psychology, sociology, philosophy, political science, literature, drama, music, physics, chemistry, biology, history. We must not be trapped by theoretical constructs or explanations that prevent us from, in the words of the hymn, prevent us from overstepping the limits of time. We must reject the premise of random and purposeless causality that impel us to ask the wrong questions, focus on the transitory at the expense of the enduring, make improper inferences, and suggest incomplete or inappropriate recommendations. 
In sum, we risk preaching for established truth, the transitory doctrines of men, seeing, as Paul expressed it, only puzzling expressions in a mirror, whereas we are summoned by our Heavenly Father to see Him face to face. As Paul wrote, My knowledge now is partial. Then, when illuminated by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, it will be whole like God's knowledge of me. All of this is why the prophets have counseled us to plumb the depths of the scriptures and the words of the living prophets in faith and prayer. In very deed, the scriptures, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, constitute the true guide to the perplexed. So that's the first characteristic of the knowledge that comes through the Holy Ghost. It is architectural. It establishes the fundamental truths, the fundamental premises of life. Secondly, as already suggested, this knowledge is definitive. Although our experiences, observations, and rational faculties may lead us to certain conclusions, they can never compel the conviction that dispels doubts and motivates endurance. I could, in fact, give quite a lecture demonstrating to you that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God and that Jesus is the Christ. I could do that using simply rational explanation and a whole line of reasoning, but it would not be compelling. That's why Peter was asked of Christ, Peter, who do people say that I am? And remember he said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, come back. And others said, well, you're Elijah. And Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And he said, thou art Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus asked or said to him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for neither flesh nor blood hath revealed this unto you, but our Father which is in heaven. Paul said that no one can say that Jesus is the Christ without the witness of the Holy Ghost. Can you see, by the way, why it's such a fearful thing to deny the testimony of the Holy Ghost, the only sin which Christ declared to be unforgivable? Because we are denying a definitive witness, something which should end any doubt in our lives. And should we deny it? Christ said all sins may be forgiven. This alone cannot because it ends argument. Now, let's look at the third characteristic of this knowledge. It is transforming. It is impossible to know the most fundamental truths without changing our lives. Paul wrote that he had the mind of Christ. And the people of King Benjamin declared that they had no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. Having received the witness of the Spirit, we are called to respond to that witness and to transform our lives. And as we do that, more truth and knowledge is open to us. Do you know it is possible to be a great physician or a great engineer or a great violinist, or a great whatever you want to do, fill in the blank, without being a good man or woman? It is possible. I've known some great physicists. I've known some great physicians. I've known some great engineers who are not particularly good people. But do you know you cannot know the most fundamental truths of the universe without being good? Because the Holy Ghost will not, in effect, reveal anything to us unless we're prepared to change our lives to that which is revealed to us. And so, indeed, as we receive knowledge upon knowledge from the Holy Ghost and change our lives accordingly, the Holy Ghost indeed becomes our comforter and our teacher. And as Neil Maxwell, Elder Maxwell, recently said, You will reach the point that the Holy Ghost will give you an answer even before you have asked the question. Now, early on, we need to ask the question. 
But you can reach such a point, having responded to that witness of the Spirit, that the Holy Ghost will then teach us, even when we haven't asked the question, sometimes even because we don't know what the question is. And when we reach that point, we may say, as Mormon declared, when he, Christ, appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified, even as he is pure. And hence the Apostle Paul declared in the epistle to the Romans, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul distinguished between human nature distorted by ignorance, false beliefs, disobedience, and one subject to God, which has been renewed by the Holy Ghost. Only when this renewal begins to take place do we really understand what the right questions are and therefore are ready to receive the right answers. As the Spirit works in us, we have a readiness of mind prepared to discern the truth and may attain, indeed, the mind of Christ. As Alma said, as we do this, our mind doth begin to be enlightened and doth begin to expand. And in latter days, the Lord has said that he requires nothing of us save a willing mind and the heart, and counseled us to treasure up in our minds continually the word of life, that our minds become single to God, and the day will come, as he himself has said, that we shall see him, for he will unveil his face unto us. This transformational power is not limited to the individual. As Paul said, it affects an entire community, an entire nation. As individuals respond to the teaching of the Holy Ghost, they change, and the group around them changes, and then the nation changes. <clears throat> now, what do we need to do to receive this witness of the Spirit? I would mention very briefly only four requirements. First of all, we need to urgently search for the truth. If you really don't want the truth, you won't get it. Second, and a part of that, we need to be willing to obey the truth once we have received it. Third, we must have a disposition to bear witness to that truth in all places and all times. And fourthly, we must be motivated to serve in truth. Let's talk just about those in turn. First of all, this desire for truth. There's a story told of Socrates, the great Greek philosopher. A young man came to him and said, Oh, Master, teach me the truth. And Socrates grabbed the young man and he thrust his head into a stream of water and held him there. And finally brought him up gasping for breath. And he said, Now, when you want wisdom as much as you wanted air, then... And only then can I teach you. You know, it's much the case with the Holy Ghost. We have to be prepared, as the prophet Joseph Smith said, to sacrifice all things. You remember the father of King Lamoni said he's prepared to give up all of his sins in order to know the truth. And Joseph Smith said many, many times, that we need to be prepared to sacrifice all things to know the truth. And then we need to be so prepared for that truth that we will indeed follow it. That it will, in fact, change the way we behave. If you learn a truth and you never change the way you live, you have not learned a truth. Great and fundamental truth always brings about great transformation. Now, that means that we need to keep the commandments. Once you know the truth, they will imply certain commandments, certain elements of how we should live. And as we keep the commandments and are prepared, by the way, to live and to speak in such a way that we represent the truth, 
then the Holy Ghost will open to us more and more truth. And then finally, having learned that, we need to serve others in truth. And then as that happens, the whole universe opens up to us. Now the opposite of this is called in the scriptures, hardness of heart. One of my favorite writers is C.S. Lewis. Have any of you here ever read the Narnia tales? Anybody in this audience ever read the Narnia tales? <laughs> well, if you haven't, I want you to run right out to the bookstore and get all volumes of the Narnia tales. Great stories. As you may recall in the Narnia tales, the, the principal character is Aslan the lion, who happens to be the lion of Judah. He is the representative of Christ. And in the final, in the final volume, in fact called the final battle, Aslan the lion and his followers, in fact, are struggling with the great white witch, who is finally defeated, and the whole land is liberated. There was one group of dwarves, by the way, who were chained up in a circle in a barn, which was their prison. But with the final victory, their chains disappeared. The barn disappeared. The stable was gone. And indeed, they were free. But they refused to believe their own liberation and stayed within their closed circle not feeling the fresh air, not seeing the sun, not smelling the flowers. Even Aslan roared in their ears to arouse them, and they mistook it for the roar of thunder or a trick. As Aslan observed, they had become so afraid of being taken in that they could not be taken out, and they were now prisoners of their own mind. He observed, Aslan observed on another occasion, O oh, Adam's sons, how cleverly you defend yourself against all that might do you good. And Nephi so plaintively wrote, And now I, Nephi, am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men. For they will not search knowledge nor understand great understanding when it is given unto them in plainness, even as plain as words can be. Brothers and sisters, we need to prepare ourselves to receive the truth. Not simply random or perishable truths, but the truth. We need to ask, and as Moroni has said, we will receive the witness of the the Spirit. And having established that truth in our lives, no matter where we go or what we do, everything we encounter, everything we see will fit. We will see where it fits. We will really grow in the most profound knowledge, even the knowledge that God has. I can say no more certainly today then I could say at age 16 that the Book of Mormon is true, that it was brought forth by a prophet of God, which prophet acted under the direction of the Father and the Son. And I can say, therefore, no more certainly today than I could have said at 16 that Jesus is the Christ. The dimensions of my knowledge have grown. My testimony has deepened. But that fundamental truth was established early in life. Young men and women should not wait to go on a mission to have received that witness of the Spirit. That should be the precondition of a mission. One should not get through this educational experience you're having at Rick's without having received the greatest education you will ever receive, and that is the teaching of the Holy Ghost, so that you will understand the most fundamental truths upon which all other knowledge will be built. I say to you with all the conviction of my heart that God lives, 
that Jesus is the Christ, that this is the church and kingdom of God. You and I are his children, heir to a great destiny. And we may say that when he, Christ, comes, we shall know him, for you and I will be like him. Of that I bear witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.